Welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Think Global Podcast. I am your host, International Seth, and today's date is March 26, 2021. We'd like to take a, a special opportunity to thank all of our subscribers on YouTube. If you haven't subscribed for, on us for YouTube, what are you waiting for? Go ahead and smash the subscribe button to follow great content and our amazing guests are coming on the show today. Today we have a fantastic guest coming on the show, an ex-NBA legend, a great human being, and just so happens to be my father. You know, it's only a small group of people who can say that they played in the National Basketball Association for 10 years. And my father, Zaid Abdulaziz, is one of those persons. So I'd like to welcome my father, Zaid Abdulaziz, onto the Think Global podcast for the very first time. Welcome, Dad. What's on to be on, son? It's good, good to talk to you. And uh, I'm really excited about what you got planned for me to talk about today. I'm really excited. Thank you. Absolutely. I'm excited as well. And we have a, for a segment on our show that we have all of our guests come, because this is an international um, show, thus the name Think Global. So all of our guests come on. We have a quick segment that we have called World Call. And that's when we give our guests 10 seconds to name off some of the countries that you have visited. So right now you have going to have 10 seconds as we put you on the World Call. Ready, go. Canada, Mexico, Morocco, uh, Amsterdam, Holland, England. Uh, can't think of another one. I can't think of. I've been okay. So many. I know. I know. It has probably been so so long ago. Um, I know Saudi Arabia. You you mentioned that you've been to Sudan, parts of Africa as that's, well. So. Uh, been to. I've, I've been to the blue and the white now and the blue now. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when was the last time you, 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 you traveled overseas? Was it Morocco? I mean, uh, I, mean I, I go overseas. Uh, it's been a long, long time, maybe over 20 years. Okay, 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 okay. So we're going to get into your, your, your story, and we, I'm sure that our guests and our audience will uh, really appreciate, and you have some, a lot of valuable information and insight. You are from Brooklyn, New York. That is the heartbeat of America. We have famous actors and celebrities such as Michael Jordan, Barbara Streisand, Eddie Murphy, Jay-Z, the Notorious Big. So what was what was it like growing up in the 1960s uh, in, in Brooklyn, New York? It was a lot more peaceful than it was, it was today. Uh, I mean, uh, we, we had core values there and, uh, and we, got, we got along with the police pretty much uh, because they kind of were our caretakers. And, then, and so... Uh, a lot of the stress that we're seeing today, it didn't exist that much back then. Uh, we we got along, and uh, the police the police would come and if a kid was doing something bad, they would come and tell their mother and father what you know what they had seen, what they observed, and they would have a meeting. Okay, so it sounds like you guys have a pretty close knit community. Of course, they had their little skirmishes and stuff like that, but as you mentioned, it's not as crazy in the amount of violence and the disrespect for the the lack of morality and the and the values that the, it has today um but there was the the vietnam war you guys went to the civil rights era uh it was a kind of a turbulent time but it did seem like it was more cohesive in the fact that people were were working together would you agree uh yeah very much so but one thing that stood, stood me off from the other kids my dad was a police officer so uh, he used to tell all his friends to keep an eye on me. So that was a protective. That was a protection I got in the unseen world. Okay, okay. When did you start playing basketball for the first time? Do you remember when you started playing basketball? I, probably, I started playing when I was eight or nine, uh, and I went. To, my dad, like I just mentioned, he got me into the YMCA, and uh, I, that's where I first started playing ball. Uh, and the great Connie Hawkins and Lenny Wilkins. And some of these players, they, they, they got their start there, uh, uh, likewise. 
So, so you mentioned the YMCA, but I know like a lot of New Yorkers, they're famous for street ball players, Stefan Marbury, um, Lamar Odom, um, you know, uh, Sebastian Telfair. They all kind of grew up playing, you know, at the local, uh, the street parks. I remember when you took me back to Brooklyn that one time, you threw me out there and you were like, hey, man, you got to go get tough. You're going to go play with the brothers out the, at the park. So um, did you have that was your main experience? I mean, you mentioned the YMCA. But were you guys just running around um, playing playing? street ball yeah we well back in brooklyn we had a designated time that we would meet like on sundays we would go to reese beach there's a beach uh, in, in in new york and then on the other times we would go down to the uh, uh Grinnell's village we play in the Fort west fourth street uh court so we would move around and kareem came down and people like dave cowens and uh billy cunningham and Fred Crawford, Bob Dandridge, these type of great players. They 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 came uh, they came down and we played. Okay, so so your high school career. Correct me if I'm wrong, because um, you really didn't play basketball in high school until what your your junior year was it? Pretty much uh, my sophomore year, pretty much, because uh, I was really really kind of shy and uh, uh, it, it was hard for me to you know to to. Uh, to toot my own horn, to toot my horn. So I always try to keep a background, some background. Well, the horn started getting a little bit louder and louder and louder as you went into your senior year because uh, you accepted an athletic scholarship to Iowa State University. Um, obviously, a young African-American kid from Brooklyn, New York, steps off the plane and, and, and is in Ames, Iowa. What are you thinking about the culture shock? Were you homesick? Did you miss your family? What was it, especially in the time back then, because this was the 60s? I had all those things going on at, at one time. You know, I was shocked. I didn't know what to do. I was nervous. And it was a different society. It was uh, Iowa State was like 90% white, and I was coming from a, a society that was uh, almost 90% black in Brooklyn. But, uh, you know, I, I just I made up my mind that I had to study and do, you know, do those type of things, so... Me, me being a party, me not being a party person uh, was easier for me, you know, because, uh, uh, you know, I used to study a lot. You, you mentioned one time to me uh, something I'll never forget. You said when you when you first got to Ames and you kind of uh, became acclimated to your surroundings, you said that was a very first time really that you 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 were aware that of the sky, you looked up, right? You looked up, you kind of saw the sky in an open environment because growing up in the city in, in New York, like it's such a major metropolitan city, you were always close about what was in front of you and what was on your peripherals, but never did you really, buildings and concrete, never did you really have the, the opportunity to kind of take it in and, and kind of look up. Yeah, a lot, of, a, a lot of tall buildings blocked the sky and everything that we, you know, we just hardly ever saw it, I mean, the Empire State Building is over 101 stories high, even though it's in New York. But there's other, the World Trade Center. Uh, we had a lot, a lot of big buildings. So uh, Brooklyn wasn't as bad as Manhattan, but Brooklyn had, you know, some tall buildings too, like the uh, the Dime Savings Bank right downtown Brooklyn, which was about a, a 10 minute walk from uh, where I live. Okay, let's talk about your, your, your collegiate career because this is something that was very, very impressive to me when I, when I learned about it. Um, you had an a, a, a incredible collegiate career. I mean, um, back then, obviously, the NCAA uh, transformed into where it is now, but back then, the, the Big 12, which is today, or is it the Big 14 now? The Big 12. Okay, so the Big 12, which is today, those are your Texas, those are your... Um, uh, what else is in the Big 12? Uh, Oklahoma and all these schools, Kansas, yeah, Oklahoma State, Kansas, okay. But back then when you were playing, it was the, the, the Big 8. So you had eight schools. Then they, added the, then they added the Texas teams, like Texas, Texas Tech, uh, Baylor, and those, 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 those great schools. So who were the, 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 the players that the, the NBA legends that were in college that you participated against at Iowa State University? I played against Kareem. Uh, his name was uh, Lou Alcid at the time. We played at uh, Pauley Pavilion, uh, and it w I had the, the 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 you know the distinction to to, to be uh, to go up against Kareem and John Wooden and that crew. 
Coach John Wood, who was a great coach. And uh, there was a there was a, a radio announcer named Chick Hearn. He said I was his favorite NBA basketball player. Uh, so that 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 was quite a, an honor for me to have the great Chick Hearn say that you know I, I was his favorite player. Well, your 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 statistic did a lie. I mean, um, I think on average your senior year. You average just a few. Um, uh, I mean, you average like twenty five point eight points. No, and, all the way. I, I average like 24, 24. 6, something 20, like that. Okay, so, so we we'll call it. We we'll round it up to twenty five points a game, and you had 14, 14 rebounds per game. Yes, that was average, man. Close to it. I mean, if you want to round it out. I mean, that is like, that is a stellar average right 25 and 14 it just doesn't really come around especially if somebody averaged 25 or 14 today they would be considered probably you know the top five or maybe one two or three in the um in in the nba draft um so you were recognized by um you know the collegiate um collegiate um audience there as a the the big eight player of the year and uh, you went ahead and got drafted to the NBA in the 1968 draft? Yeah, 68, 69, right, exactly, right. And uh, I got drafted by the Cincinnati Royals and the great Oscar Robinson, who played, you know, for the Cincinnati Royals. So, so one t let's take one step back until in 2008, you took myself, my brothers and sisters for a very, very proud moment in your life. And one that really inspired me, your jersey was uh, lifted up into the, the Iowa State, uh, was it Hilton Coliseum? And your, 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 your jersey was retired, your number 35 jersey was retired. How did that make you feel? It was just, uh, what, what can I say, you know, but... I've always tried not to have a big head, and I try to play it down as much as I can. But it, it was touching to me; it brought tears to my eyes that, you know, that they would think about putting my number up there. It was great. So, since the Seattle Royals, there wasn't a team that's in the the modern day NBA today. But you were picked fifth overall, number five overall in the 1968 draft. What, did they have an actual – when I think of the NBA draft, I think of Dervis, David Stern, may rest in peace. Um, and now they have uh, – what is it? Dave, um, Silva or – yeah, Adam, Adam, Adam Silva. Silva um, calling the players up to the podium, giving them a hat, shaking their hand with their players have a nice suit on. Was was there a draft back then? Like, was there a full no, draft? We didn't, have, we didn't have that. They just uh, told me I was drafted fifth. In the NBA draft, the first person drafted was Elvin Hayes from the University of Houston. The Wes Unsel was number three. Number two, I was number five. A guy by the name of Tom Borwinkle went number three. And another guy, Bob Kaufman, went number four. I went number five. Okay, so how did so I we mean, didn't, how? We, we didn't have all, we didn't have all the, you know, uh, TV and radio stuff back then like we have today, I mean. But so, uh, we, we, you know, I never, you know, we never had that back so, then. So you get this phone call. I don't know who told you, but somebody told you, hey, you just got picked fifth overall in the draft. You're going to go play for the Cincinnati Royals, and you're going to start your NBA career. How did that make you feel? I felt kind of bad because I wanted to go to the Knicks. I always wanted to play for the Knicks. So when I got drafted by Cincinnati, uh, I, I really didn't want to go there. And... Uh, to, to, to something that ha happened negative to me was going to Cincinnati because uh, it, it was is a is a low you know uh, small market but New imagine New York and I and I was a New York type player I, I I used to like to run you know up and down the court so I wanted to go to a team like the Knicks and uh, Red Holtzman who who you know, would allow me to run and shoot you know. And, 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 and you know those type of things. What was your what was your what was your rookie contract worth? Because we're trying to understand players nowadays get millions and millions of dollars, but the value of the millions aren't the same as it was back then, right? Like you could the value of money back then was a lot uh, more valuable than it is right now. So what was the fifth pick overall in the uh, NBA uh, earning back then for a rookie salary? 
Well, if you, I, I might make a mistake on this. I, can, I can't remember exactly because money was never my thing. <laughs> but uh, uh, I would say I, I, 150000 I think I signed for for three years. So it was a three-year, $150,000 contract I signed with the, uh, the Houston Rockets because I, after leaving the Cincinnati, I, they, they, they traded me. But uh, it was 150000 was my highest year pay, but I had a no cut. So 450000 for three years. That's, that's good money. And to put that in perspective, you told me that um, the, the actress Barbara Sarsfans, she's bought a Hollywood home. Uh, what was it? You said for 210000 right? In Hollywood? Yeah. Yeah. So those homes are tens of millions of dollars now. So um, what was the difference between competing in college and competing uh, in the NBA during your first couple of years? Well, well, the NBA, the NBA was easier for me to play because in college, they used to have special defenses. Kansas had a Don Smith defense. And they, they would put two, two people on me at a, all the time. So when I got to the NBA, uh, and then they, would pay, then they would do certain type of zones on me to try to stop me, but it, it never worked. So when I, got to the, when I got to the NBA, I was one-on-one -on -one because there's no zone there. So uh, uh, I, I was just so it was I, I like playing in the NBA it was easier for me than, than college. So you you played ten seasons in the NBA and you played with um, a few different franchises. Uh, I think um, from after your your your, your rookie your rookie uh, year in Cincinnati, you said you got traded directly to Houston, or was it to Milwaukee first? Yeah, no, I got traded to uh, Milwaukee. Okay, so you were in Milwaukee. You actually played with um, Lou Alcindor, uh, who later on became Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and the legendary Oscar Robinson. Yes, I played with uh, I played with Kareem. I was a power forward on that team, and he came the next year. And uh, we had a really good team. We made the playoffs that year. And Kareem, uh, you know, talking about the goat, he could be the goat. You know, the greatest of all time. And he was fantastic. He just doesn't get enough recognition. Pretty much like the last week when, uh, you know, when Elgin Baylor passed away, and El Elgin was a great player too. So, uh, what I what what I'm what I'm seeing now, not enough uh, uh, not enough is said about the the players who played in the '70s. Not enough was said how great they were. So, I hope that one day people start looking into the players because I felt bad that Elgin Baylor didn't get his due when he was alive. And uh, he's getting it now when he's passed. Okay. What? So, so you you were pra I mean, you were practicing against uh, the the sky hook many times in practice. I mean, how would you try to defend? That? How would you try to defend that shot? I mean, what was what was that? Did you see him practicing like that all the time? These these sky hook repeatedly over and over again. I I don't think I've I've looked at uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's highlights, and I think I only seen him take a jump shot like a regular jump shot like once or twice. Everything else was either dunks, layups, or the sky hook. Well, they call it poetry in motion. I've never seen a person as, you know, Cream. he hardly ever got hurt. He broke his hand one time because he got angry at a, a, a player that was fouling him. But he was just amazing. He could run like a little man. He could, that sky hook was unstoppable. It was unblockable. I, I blocked it a few times, but he dunked on me a few times also. Well, you went on to play for the Seattle Supersonics. You mentioned the Houston Rockets, and you had a quick stint with the Boston Celtics. What organization or franchise um, did you enjoy your tenure the most? I would say Houston because I went down to Houston. I signed a three-year, $150,000 I mean, $150, contract. I couldn't be cut. Uh, they couldn't trade me or anything for three years, so... I had some permanence, but when I came into the league, there was no permanence in Cincinnati. I didn't like the way I was treated there. They picked the number one pick, and it, it, then they didn't play me. All they, they hardly ever played me, played me. So there was some politics going on. There were other people on the team, uh, on the Cincinnati Royals, that the coach was friends of, and they, you know, they they, they put him in front of me. So. One thing, you know, I really felt bad about that. I and mean, then they just got rid of me. So that's when I went to Milwaukee. And 
Uh, as soon as I got to Milwaukee that year, the next game I got 20, 23 rebounds. Then the next game I got another 23 rebounds. I looked at, you know, so when they, they let me go, I got triple uh, back-to-back 23 rebounds games yeah. when I was with uh, Milwaukee. Well, I think even you, you are known for a very tenacious rebounder. We have some of your NBA cards right here. And oh, this is, yeah, yeah. So we, I have these in my, my keepsake. Here's one that you played for the Rockets. Here's one with Milwaukee. Oh, wow. Yeah. And here's one, another one with, with, with the Rockets here. Now, on the back yeah. of these, they actually have some of your stats. And uh, it says right here, six foot ten, two hundred and thirty pounds, and uh, birthplace Brooklyn, New York school, Iowa State. And it's all uh, you have. You average a uh, double double um, out of those ten years for almost four years, four four seasons. You average a double double. That's um, ten or more points and ten or more rebounds. So that is a f- fantastic feat as well. I mean, to average a double double in the NBA for four seasons. That is a fantastic um, career. Yeah, I, I think it was something like that. But I, I just know if you divide it, I think I, play, I had 157 double-doubles in my career. I don't know if that's four years, but uh, the math, uh, yeah, it's, it's close. Yeah, yeah. 157 double-doubles in my career, which is a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. So what do you think um, you're <laughs> – you know, obviously, I average a double double. You know. Yeah, yeah. What do you think the biggest yeah. um, changes are from the era that you played in the '70s to the the the, the era of, of of basketball today? Uh, with the you know the 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 rules changes and the kind of uh, softness of the NBA, the referees and the new changes in the rules, a three-point shot, all of that. What are some of the, the things that makes a difference from the, your era that you played in? I, you know, sometimes I, I feel that, that, that I don't want to be negative. But I just have to say it the way I am, the way it is. The players today, they're not as tough as we were. You know, and uh, you can't hand a guy to, today. Back then, a guy come down the middle, you can get killed driving in, in the lane there. But they, 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 there's, there's not the competitive toughness anymore. It, it, so it's, it, it, you know, it seems like uh, entertainment. You know, a lot of players could take off if they got a headache. Uh, or if they have a, um, I remember M- Michael Jordan, he had a, he had a, he had a temperature and he played. You know, because he had, he, you know, he had, you know, he, he loved the game. And it, you know, imagine, you know, fans come to the game to see you play and you're not playing. This, this is what's happening today. One player says, I'm not going to play today. I'm just, I want to take a day off. But the, the mom and dad are paying for their son to go see, or son or daughter to go see Michael. And, uh, you, you know, so that's why Michael, you know, he, he played he played all the time, you know, under certain circumstances, very negative sometimes, you know. So uh, that's what bothered me. I remember when I first got with the Cincinnati Royals, uh, we, we were in Ohio and we had, we had 14 games, uh, no, we had eight games back to back to back to back, back to back to back in, 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 in eight different uh, Ohio cities. And Oscar Robertson, the great Oscar Robertson, Oscar, he said, hey, I can't believe this crazy schedule. He didn't complain, but he just said, I can't believe this. We're playing eight consecutive in eight different cities. And we busted. We took a bus. Eight different, eight in a row, eight games in a row. Today, they don't allow you to play more than two, two, two games back to back. When I played with Houston, I remember we had two games in a row, one day off, and we had three games, three games back to back to back. And nobody complained because we loved the game and we had respect for the fans and we had respect for the NBA. Wow. So, who are some of your 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 your, your favorite players that are, are are playing are playing in today's era? Well, believe it or not, I like James Harden, and uh, he even though he doesn't play defense, I've never seen a, a offensive player like this. I mean, his total package he's he's kind of heavy set, and he doesn't jump that high. But he, I, I really love this watch him play. He he just amazes me, and of course, you know. 
Kevin, Kevin, uh, uh, Durant, Kevin Durant, and uh, some great players, you know, out here today. And uh, I like those two a lot. So your your NBA journey, your growing up journey, your Iowa State journey, all culminated in um, you sharing your your life story with um, the rest of the world via this vehicle right here, which is your autobiography called Darkness to Sunlight. Um, what made you want to write this book, and what is this book about? The book is about how a kid grew, growing up in Brooklyn, he becomes... Uh, to be honest with you, I'm really not a sports person, believe that or not, but I'm like a, I was like a little prodigy. You know, I remember Bobby Fischer, the great chess champion. He became a grandmaster at the age of 13. Nobody in the world, the Russians, the Iranians, they, they couldn't play him. They, they couldn't beat him in chess. So I was pretty much the same way. I just had natural ability and I had leaping ability and I had shooting ability that was on a really, really high level. And uh, uh, so it wasn't me. It was just the creator who gave me that, that ability to play like that. So, and I, and I was always extremely shy. I never liked to brag about myself, which some people say that's why, you know, I didn't get the glory or, or the respect that I got when I played because, you know, we got agents who push your, your, uh, you know, your, your life and they, they push you out there, keep you speaking engagements and stuff like that. I, I, I really never had that. Maybe twice, once or twice in my career. So why why did you decide to 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 write this book? Because I had to. Uh, so many people have done so many good things for me, like uh, the late Hank Whitney, who got me in Iowa State. If it wasn't for him, I owe him everything. And he passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, Dorothy Erskine, who when I when I had my she worked for the registrar in Iowa State. When I had my downtimes, I said, Mrs. Erskine, I'm going back to Brooklyn. She would say, no, you're not. You're coming over to my house. You're going to have some meatloaf and potatoes, a pumpkin pie. You're not going home. So she, 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 she persuaded me to stay at Iowa State and not leave. People like that. And uh, I, I just, I, I, I just uh, the country and Western singer, John, George Hamilton IV, I met when I was a young kid. He's in the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville, Tennessee. He took me to breakfast when I was a little kid, and I never forgot it. I never had a, I've never had a prejudice bone in my body about any nationality or any person. So uh, he, he was the one who helped me with that because here's this kid, here's this kid, little kid. He took, he took me to breakfast when I was just like 12 years old, and he, he bought me breakfast. I never forgot that. So and, and we, we reunited after 50 years, over 50 years. He passed away about four years ago. And uh, I just, you know, it, it, you know, I just had to thank him for taking me out. And because uh, he never knew I played NBA, but he took me out to breakfast when I was a little kid, when I went to the rock and roll show in Brooklyn. So most people would think that uh, a 10 year, NBA veteran like yourself who wrote an autobiography, it would be about statistics and basketball and bam, 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 pouncing the ball around. But this book is so much more than that, isn't it? On um, the back of it, it's an overview. It says this is a story not just about basketball, but about a man who overcome daunting personal, relation, a, a racial, professional, and spiritual hardships. Who is this book? Can who, who can relate to this book uh, that you wrote, uh, your autobiography, and what lessons can they learn from it? Everybody can relate to that book because it, it is exactly what it says. It says darkness to sunlight. Uh, we all have dark moments. We have good moments, and uh, we have light moments. You know, sometimes things are going perfect for us, and all of a sudden something comes comes from, comes from out of the blue and just knocks us down and causes us to, to reflect. Uh, I, I grew up in a time when there was a lot of racism uh, in the South, uh, but I've seen I've seen a lot of improvement. Even though, I mean, even though uh, you know, even though uh, you know, people people go through journeys, and uh, that's what I learned that people go through journeys, and we and in our time right now we go through a journey. But I see a lot of people starting to love one another 
especially when the pandemic hit. And people are people are trying now. They're trying to do what's right. Of course, there's those who are trying to do bad, but I think it's shifted somewhat. Fair enough, fair enough. Okay, well, what I'll do is I'll put a link in the description below of where our audience can go ahead and find this book. If they want to order it, you guys can order it from the, from the link below. And um, it's a great book. I've learned so much about you by, by reading the book. A lot of things that I didn't know, it kind of connected the dots. And um, it's, 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 it was an inspiration, and it, it, it really, really um, in, in inspired me to do good. And uh, i just like to thank you for being such a humble uh, father and a, a, a good guide in my life. And, and you really have inspired me and our siblings. And uh, I love you from the bottom of my heart. And um, yeah, thank you so much for, for being you. If you guys um, want to, to, to have any questions, maybe for, for my father, the 10 year MBA vet, the, the author, you can go ahead and email um, at global at Azamco, and I'll forward it on to 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 the NBA legend, and uh, he would love to 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 comment and to 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 answer your, any of your questions. Um, Dad, do you have any any last words of advice, maybe for the the youth or anybody else that maybe be struggling um, with anything that they got going on? Just some words of advice or encouragement for um, that you'd like to leave us with today. Well, you know, never always follow your dreams. Never. Never let people say, you know, you're not this or you're not that. You believe in what you're doing and have some faith in what you're doing because miracles happen. And if you, when you read my book, you'll see, you'll see a number of miracles that happened to me in my life. But there were times I was frustrated. There was times I wanted to give up and not, you know, not, uh, you know, not, not play basketball or not, or leave Iowa. But there was always somebody to help me and, and, and lead me in the right direction. Uh, my mother, my father, uh, Mrs. Erskine, uh, 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 my good friend in uh, Iowa, uh, Tom Goodman and his family, he, you know, and uh, they treated me like family uh, when I was there. And uh, of course, I had my problems. And when you read the book, you'll see the problems that I did have. Just imagine. Uh, just living in a in a different society for for four years, and you had a you know you you had a struggle, and that's that that goes for anybody. Say a white person moves to Harlem like 20 years ago, you, you you're going to have a problem, or a Chinese guy moving to Japan, you know you're going to have a problem. So uh, uh, it's how you it's how it's how the problem is given to you, and, and how you try to solve it. And I try to solve it by just doing what I could for different people and helping. Well, there it is. You just heard an exclusive interview with Mr. Zaid Abdulaziz here on the Think Global podcast. Make sure you run out and get the book, Darkness and Sunlight, uh, Amazing Journey of Zaid Abdulaziz with the legendary forward by the, by the legend Oscar Robinson. Again, thank you for subscribing to the channel below at, at Think Global Podcast, and we hope to see you again. In the meantime, remember, it's a big world out there, so we got to think global. Until then, next time, y'all. Peace.